recently, uh, I've ended up with infrastructure in a uh, major downtown uh, data center, if that's personally mine. And the opportunity to do so, some work on a project came up. And it was an interesting project um, in that they were uh, the folks I was working with were looking to do some layer three routing um, with as much flexibility as possible. Um, and in this particular case, the actual uh, requirements in terms of bandwidth were pretty low. We're talking only 100 megabits uh, upstream and downstream out of the cabinet, um, but the cross cabinet uh, traffic uh, could get a little higher in terms of uh, subtenants in the, in the traffic. But we're not talking full gigabit speeds here because the subtenants themselves are limited to 100 megabits per second. And I was thinking about this problem and I realized um, that a Raspberry Pi, particularly the Model 3B Plus, actually fits within those parameters. Uh, one thing you may not know about the Raspberry Pi, and I suspect many here do, um, is that the Ethernet interface is on the USB bus. And traditionally, this has been limited to just straight up 100 meg uh, because it's uh, the chip choice they've chosen. But with the Raspberry Pi 3B Plus specifically, they put a gigabit phi on there, making it practically limited to 400 megabits per second uh, by the USB bus. Well, I've got a set of requirements, and suddenly this device seems to fit right in them. With a gig of RAM and the quad cores, it's got enough juice to do this relatively straightforward task. Um, so then I had to think a little bit about, well, what are the constraints I need to work in here? Well, the first thing that uh, came up during a conversation with uh, Giles, one of the fellow GTL members here, uh, was, well, what if you have to reboot it? And it's like, oh, right, everything goes down. I need two of them. <laughs> um, and once you go high availability, you get uh, certain advantages in that you can start to do maintenance during business hours, which means you're not doing late night, take the customers down situations. You can do real meaningful work when everyone else is awake and can help you. And in an organization, that's a very powerful thing to have. So let's move on to the, the, the second part of this project, the constraints. So the cabinet this is going in is, is a quarter cabinet. So that's about 10 rack units of usable space. We lose two of them due to PDUs, um, and four of them are dedicated to subtenants. So we've got a very limited space in this cabinet. So we've, we've really got to strict stick into the one use space. In reality, this is going to sit in front of the switch <laughs> that these are going to connect to. So that one U uh, constraint is really important. And that will come up as I talk about this project. Um, now here comes another one is the Raspberry Pis uh, have another limitation. If you halt them, not reboot, but uh, say shut down, you can't easily bring them back up. Um, and so you've got to have some sort of remote power control on them because you have to literally restore power to them to get them to boot up again. Um, and this is in a data center. So going out there to service any issues while it's booting, like FS checks or someone screwed up the FS tab, or uh, and I have literally had this happen at work this week. Someone uh, caused a chamod on the password file and no one could log in. <laughs> um, that was fun. Um, but um, you got to be able to have a console, a keyboard mouse experience with the machine. Um, and we have a certain set of ideals. Uh, this organization is uh, financially limited in what they can do. 
Um, and so whatever solution we come to, we want it to be able to be supportable in the long term in terms of software and hardware, but also easily upgradable. And this means kind of off the shelf parts. So that's kind of the requirements we're working with. And this lovely photo here is, is the, the home test lab where I've been working on this. Um, so the two black boxes are just uh, the Raspberry Pi 3B pluses, and the other two on the side are just uh, some older uh, Raspberry Pi 2s that I have doing client duty for testing the software side and being remote clients, replicating other things in the data center scenario. So let's go back to that list of requirements. Um, I missed one, uh, perform maintenance during business hours. So what one of the things that ties into this is being able to uh, completely reprovision uh, a downed node uh, remotely. Now, in traditional PC and server hardware, this is done using PXE or network boot. And that's not exactly, uh, well, network boot is available for the Raspberry Pis. It's not straight up trivial. What I have found and a project I've relied for, uh, on in the past is unattended net install for the Raspberry Pi. This is a wonderful project uh, if you're looking to do stuff with Raspberry Pis because you literally just burn their minimal SD card image. You can drop in a, confi uh, a config file that tells it what you want in terms of packages, what uh, networking configuration you want. If you've got wireless, you can pre-configure the wireless. A whole range of features. But my favorite part is it is an absolute minimal install of Raspberry Pi OS, uh, formerly Raspbian, um, in that um, when I log into a machine for the first time with installing from this, I can see the entire process table in the terminal when I do top. It is so minimal. And that means that I can uh, bring up just what I need on a given Raspberry Pi. I don't have to worry about uh, their GUI installation, all their extraneous tools. Um, and so that's a, I find it's a really good option if you're looking for something headless, which this is. It makes it very easy to reprovision. So much so that um, if you update the slash boot partition of a running Raspberry Pi system uh, with their uh, installation image and reboot it, you can actually take a running system and completely reinstall it uh, remotely. And so this starts to get to into our, uh, solve some of the problems of how do we um, remotely maintain this system or do recovery. Uh, or make it easy for uh, uh, remote administrators to get a down system back up and running. And you can even at that point get a, a smart hands request for just replacing the SD card. Uh, and then it will come up, be useful and SSHable, especially if you put your SSH key in the config file. So that next comes power. Because we're in this one U, we have this one U requirement. We need to think about the size of the power bricks. Most power bricks, if the uh, orientation of the outlet is wrong, won't fit in a one U space. This is one of the areas where the Raspberry Pi Foundation has really upped their game in that uh, power over ethernet is available for the Raspberry Pis now. Um, and this is an additional hat um, you'll see an extra little pin header in the corner here. And this is where uh, the power is brought in, processed by the hat, and brought out and backfed into the GPIO. This means that we can power the Raspberry Pi uh, from a single cable, which is also the networking. Really tidies things up. And this goes back to uh, our constraints. Can we remotely uh, control the power of the system? In the case of this deployment, where we have a network switch with power over Ethernet and per port control of the network switch, we actually can power cycle the uh, Raspberry Pi. So we can turn it off, turn it on, by just turning on and off uh, PoE on the port it's connected to. 
Cool. We managed to uh, fill one of the gaps in our constraints. Now, let's move on to the next constraint, being able to uh, observe the boot and intervene if anything's going wrong. Well, the Raspberry Pi has a, a serial interface using TTL uh, logic. And so getting boards uh, to interface uh, USB to that is great. And since we're doing two of these Raspberry Pis to cover for each other, um, we can actually just cross-link with USB cables from one Pi to the next. And so while one Pi is primary, we can go and reboot the secondary, watching its serial console output and interacting with it through the USB adapter plugged into the current primary. This is great. These are uh, pretty inexpensive. You can get cheap ones for three bucks to about 10 bucks Canadian for this Pi UART pictured here. Now, let's go back to this photo. The first problem I had to overcome was the official Raspberry Pi hat does not leave you any GPIO to connect your uh, UART to. And this was a problem. Now, you can kind of get around this with stacking headers. And so you can bring those pins back up and then you can connect to those. But if we go back to our requirements, must fit in one view of rack space. Well, if we keep stacking things with these headers, we keep raising the height of the, of the Pi, and we actually start to violate this constraint. Oh dear. Well, especially considering that I want to build this into a, a reasonable aluminum case, partly to help keep the heat down, but also to protect the equipment while it's in the cage. And we're definitely running out of space if we go this route with a, a case like this. So you start doing your research and what do you know? There's a whole third party market for Raspberry Pi PoE hats because the interface is standard. It's just the Raspberry Pi Foundation offers their official module, but I've literally found a half dozen alternative modules, including this one from 52Pi. And you'll note that uh, the GPIO on it is uh, rather conveniently left clear. So cool, we've got our power, we've got a remote console, we've got all the ingredients. Now let's shake it up and actually see if they all work together. And so I've gotten pretty far with that. Um, if we look at the GPIO layout for the Raspberry Pi, we'll see that the Pi hat, uh, the PoE is tied into the five volt lines here for powering the Pi and the ground line here. The next two pins I need are for the serial console and I need a ground for that so that they uh, don't, uh, when you're dealing with serial, you need the ground reference so that it knows uh, when you've actually pulled the line low for TTL logic um, because the default state as I've discovered um, is that the idle state of a TTL serial line is voltage high. And this is going to become important in a moment. Um, because this whole setup works until I reboot it. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have discovered that the serial adapter is providing enough back current across the uh, serial lines and the fact that there's a slight 0 0 0.2, 0 0.2 volt difference between the grounds in my particular setup that is actually interfering with the PoE hat. And so when I cut power to the, the Raspberry Pi, the PoE hat doesn't shut down properly. When I re-add power, the PoE hat is supposed to negotiate to receive that power and doesn't. The my boot monitoring system is preventing the Raspberry Pi from booting. Oh dear lord. Well, let's go on from there. It, all the parts don't work together. How do I solve this? And this is where I move on to, well, I need to electrically isolate the two halves of the system. The, the side that's being powered from the other Pi that's monitoring the serial adapter 
and the Pi that's just been uh, powered down. And surprisingly, this is a common enough problem that there are um, a set of solutions known as level shifters. Now, these are normally used for dealing with um, when you've got uh, digital logic or serial logic that happens to be different uh, voltages at its high. So an Arduino is an excellent example. It's a 5 volt logic uh, chip. And the Raspberry Pis are 3.3 volts in their logic. But my hope here, and I'm still testing this, is that I can use this chip to do the isolation uh, necessary and my initial tests are proving positive, but I haven't yet given stable results, and that's because they ke ke still keep to try trying to tie the ground planes together. So I'm trying to figure this out. But it's a wonderful little chip um, that has the added advantages of when uh, the voltage from one side goes away, it actually shuts down uh, the bidirectional pins that the, si the signals are traveling off. And this is how I hope to be able to keep the PoE hat from being interfered from the adapter. Uh, some alternatives with, to this uh, might be using FETs, which I'm still exploring, because I'm while I've gotten the solution working, I'm having some stuttering issues with the serial, which suggests to me I've still got some wonkiness going on. But this is the what the test break looks right now. Now, that takes care of trying to solve the hardware problems. We can now, look, going back to the constraints, use a bunch of off-the-shelf parts that are relatively inexpensive, that can fit in one view of rack space, where we can control the power on and off and monitor the system up and down. Um, because we can use software packages like Keep Alive D to move a virtual IP between the two pies, and the services we're doing, which is routing, is stateless, we can actively just move the traffic between the two pies, allowing us to do maintenance on either one during business hours. We're actually pretty close to a working solution. Um, and in that regard, I'm going to stop my screen share here, share my lovely face again, and open the floor to questions about uh, what I've been doing on this so far. Uh, feel free to use those raise hand buttons. Uh, Alan, if you could moderate, that would be great. Absolutely. Um, Stuart I made a comment saying there are micro USB cables that are power isolated so they don't pass the five volt to the other machine. Could That's that, not the uh, problem. It's the tying of the two ground planes the, uh, and the uh, actual voltage on the uh, serial lines. The serial, serial logic, is kept, as I've discovered through this process, is voltage high at idle. So the, no matter what, you're passing 3.3 volts on the transmit line uh, and receive lines, and you've tied the ground plane in. So I've also looked at opto isolators for this, but uh, my reading suggests that their response times aren't fast enough uh, for the serial speeds I'm looking at. So this is why I was looking at more complex chips for this problem. Um, any other questions? How much of this has gone over people's heads? <laughs> Uh, can I uh, can I uh, give you a very dumb suggestion? Of course. Uh, what if you use relay for the serial, like that that shuts down the whole thing? <sighs> Relays are physically big objects, uh, so we quickly run into space constraint. And I'm trying to keep the amount of soldering to a minimum here in order to meet the ideal of uh, easy to replace uh, off the shelf parts. Um, and it's an interesting idea. The, 
the, it comes down to how do I control the relays uh, in a reliable manner, and which side do I do it from? Um, so, well, I mean, you can if you get like a five volt relay, you can control it from one of the pins, and like you, you can just do the same thing as with serial, put it on the same, uh, um, have, having the same configuration. It's just when you have this trouble with serial connection, you just, I don't know, run uh, uh, run a piece of code that brings relay too high or too low and it will disconnect, like cut the serial physically. Then it's it's kind of like, 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 like um, uh, almost like a hardware switch that you can run directly from a pen. But yeah, uh, it, it, it's sort of like, if nothing else works, use relay, but there's probably a better solution for it. If I have to go there, I have to go there. But my hope is to uh, make this as seamless as possible. The second you start having to introduce, uh, you must do this special magic in order to reboot properly. Uh, it becomes a less maintainable solution in my mind. Um, but if it's what I have to do, well, I'll, I'll figure that out. Thanks. Actually, actually, I don't think it's even going to be a lot of magic. So you can run relay off a pin. So uh, what, what you have to do is like create a script that will uh, ki kill the um, uh, kill the power and then add a couple of lines that reset that pen for, for the relay. So it might not be that much more difficult, but again, you will still have to do a lot of soldering, which is, if you can't avoid it, you should probably shoot. The, the other uh, interesting concern I have with that is if you want to monitor the boot, you then have to remember to re-enable it and the same time as you re-enable power to the Pi. So you've got this blind window where you don't know if the Pi has powered up correctly or not uh, because you reapplied the serial too soon. So getting full isolation would be more ideal. Um, you can probably, you, you know what you can do? You can run that relay off the power over ethernet i'm sorry this is getting more stupid <laughs> it's getting more complicated and that's no no no, no. In, in, instead of running a relay off the pin of raspberry pi you run the relay from the uh spliced cable that feeds uh, five volts to the raspberry pi and what when it shuts down relay disconnects and when it turns up relay connects and you can probably oh there's your first misunderstanding about PoE. Um, it's not, PoE is not just p power on the cable. That's POC and is actually non-standard. PoE is a negotiated protocol. They use a bit of the phantom power in the, in the uh, ethernet connection to actually communicate with the power sourcing equipment, i.e. the switch, to say, I am a PoE device. I will accept PoE. I will accept PoE at these voltages and current and expected current draw. Please turn it on. And so, uh, and by the way, that's at forty-eight volts. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm I'm gonna stop now because my solution is redoing everything with relays, and it's probably not the best thing. <laughs> Um, so I've got a comment in the chat asking how uh, we're turning the power on and off remotely. This is a feature of the network switch where we can, from the switch, say, disable power over Ethernet on that port, which would force a shutdown because we've just cut power to the device. It's quite literally pulling the power cord. And then we can re-enable uh, PoE on that port, at which point the PoE hat will go, hey, I'm a PoE device. Can I have power? And the switch will send it power forcing a reboot. Uh, so thank you, JV and chat. Any other questions for Scott? No. Okay. Thank you very much, Scott. That was uh, quite interesting. And uh, I love to see projects using the Raspberry Pi. They are uh, they're always intriguing, um, especially when you can find real world business solutions to use them. Yeah. Um, the, right. Right now, um, uh, the the provider I've got the tenancy from 
uh, the switch they're using, which has layer three capabilities, has uh, some undesirable uh, misfeatures, uh, like that if you don't have any ports active in a uh, VLAN that has uh, one of your gateway addresses, it doesn't bring up the gateway address. So you can't ping it. Yeah, it's really stupid, which is why this solution is interesting to them because it means that it can be always on, always pingable, testable, verifiable, and it gives them the full Linux firewall stack to actually manage the traffic the way, the way they want, as opposed to within the limitations of the 10-year-old uh, firmware of this switch. <laughs> So you're actually upgrading them, really. Putting them on a standard Linux release also means that they can continue to get software updates as long as uh, Raspberry Pi OS exists. And yeah, without the limitation of the switch. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and I don't think the switch will do IPv6 long term, and that's somewhere we need to go. True, true.